Right, hello everybody. My name is Brandon Spenoff. I'm from uh, I'm, I'm the head of networks at UFiver. I've been at UFiver for about uh, just over a year and a half. Uh, but enough about me. I'm just going to quickly introduce a, um, a little update on the on UFiver. So first, um, who is UFiber and what do we do? So if it isn't obvious by the name, we are obviously an FTTP broadband internet service provider. Uh, we, we actually began or, or was founded in, in 2019 and uh, didn't actually deploy our first exchange until 2020. Um, so it, it, hopefully you guys can see the, 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 the brighter pink area is actually where we focused on uh, when we first deployed our first exchange, uh, which is obviously in the, in the northeast region of, of England. So we specifically deployed at Durham, Peter Lee, Spennymoor. Those were the first type of exchanges or the, the, the area that we focused on. But, but as you can see, um, there, there's a point here on the third point is that we, we do have presence in every country slash region of the UK. Uh, I do apologize about the map. Uh, as you can see, England, we do, we do uh, regionalize northeast, northwest. But for some reason, we don't seem to do that with Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. So I do apologize about that diagram. Um, in terms of numbers, we, we have 2,500 connected customers in October 2021. Doesn't seem like a lot, but um, 10,000 tw June 2022. We, we are slowly growing uh, as an ISP. We, we haven't been around for too long, um, but you can clearly see those numbers are slowly going up. Um, and they, they fit in line with NetOmnia, so I'll, I'll slowly talk about NetOmnia as, as the slides go on. On our point on uh, deploying our network over multiple access networks, uh, as of recently, we, we were only deploying our network on top of uh, NetOmnia. So NetOmnia are the kind of uh, fiber uh, builders. They build the fiber, build the OLTs, and provide a handover point for us to then connect to our customers, et cetera. Um, and, and the reason why I do put UFiber and NetOmnia here is because we are actually two entities under the same group. That is substantial group. Uh, enough of the boring stuff anyway, we're, we're going to get onto the technical stuff, the, the, the more interesting uh, topics. So just a quick, a very, very high overview of, of the network. I thought I'd just uh, throw this out because it would be a bit more interesting than, than uh, the previous slide. We've got data centers located in London, Wales, Manchester, Edinburgh. We're, we're probably going to build a, a data center in, in Northern Ireland to uh, specifically route out our customers you know, across, across England, but um, uh, across the UK. So again, that's my point coming back to that. We, we are now all over the, the whole of the UK. We, we've got Northern Ireland, uh, Wales, Scotland, and England. So that's, that's really, really fun stuff um, in, in terms of the UFiber network. Located at every data center, we've, we've got a, um, a compute resources, as, as everyone would, uh, specifically CGNAT. So, because we are a, a small ISP, we've only started quite recently within the past two years uh, with our deployment. We, we are using CGNAT for IPv4. Hence, this discussion is obviously the next slide will be about IPv6, how we, we're deploying that. Just another uh, point on our network is, is that we, we build dark fiber between exchanges, or should I say we, we, we um, purchase those services to build dark fiber between exchanges. And for high, high throughput, we, we use ZR4 plus optics uh, as of recently to, to meet those high bandwidth demands. And then, um, as mentioned previously, NetOmnia, so we've built in, in every exchange. NetOmnia build in every BT exchange. Or should I say, every exchange that they build in is a BT exchange. We, we install a router, and then we connect with their equipment using a, an NNI. They, they hand over an NNI. So we are located at every exchange that uh, NetOmni are, are located at. And in terms of hardware and, or vendors, we use Cisco and uh, a mix of EdgeCore, which, which is actually OCNOS, IP Infusion OCNOS software running on top of the EdgeCore hardware. So, on to the more interesting things now with, with IPv6. The existing IPv6 deployment, um, the top point is a bit of an obvious one. Uh, all of our server infrastructure and core is already IPv6. I, I don't know why I put that in there. That's, that's an obvious point. Uh, we, we deploy slash 38 to e each exchange with a slash 56. Um, we, we've done this in the past. I mean, most of us that work in UFiber have come from other alt nets, and we've just pretty much built the, the same how we've built in previous alt nets. The, the third point is a bit too technical to go into detail. Um, for, for the given amount of time that I've got allocated, but essentially it's DHCPv6 proxy with persistent database. 
the reason I put this point in there is, is because I just wanted to tell you a quick 30-second uh, story on that when we used to upgrade routers or exchanges, we'd reboot the re router on the maintenance release. The CPEs would know how to get customers behind the CPEs would, would, would obviously use an IPv6 address from that de delegated prefix. And then when you reboot the router, which has obviously got that state that tells the, um, uh, the network how to get back to the customer, that stuff isn't there when, when you reboot the router. So you're essentially black holing uh, the traffic. So I thought I'd just make that point there that we use DHCP v6 proxy. If anyone wants to talk about it a bit more, then obviously come, come get me after the chat. Um, so I mentioned previously we use Cisco and Oknos. 40% of our exchanges are Cisco, 60% of Oknos. So we ran into an issue recently with, with our current network's design not supporting uh, IPv6 prefix delegation. And that's, that's, that's specifically related to VRFs. Uh, again, I won't go into too much. To there's not enough time to talk about that. Um, but if you're using Oknos, if anyone's using Oknos, that would be brilliant to, to have a chat about that if you haven't run into that issue yet with um, VRFs and IPv6 leaking from the, VR, uh, from the VRF. So here, um, it's, it's just a couple of points on how we plan on improving our IPv6 deployment. Uh, what, what, what we plan on doing. The first point is a bit of a, it seems like a very administrative nightmare with statically allocating a slash 56 to every single customer. Um, I mean, I, I'd love it if you could just absolutely roast me on, on that if, if you think that's a terrible idea. Um, however, I think it's achievable if you can automate um, everything with your, with your CRM, OSS, BSS when, when a customer orders uh, a service and you essentially create that static uh, IPv6 um, allocation in a database somewhere. So that's, that's obviously to avoid the end user device issues that we've run into in the past where IPv6, uh, a smart TV or, or such like a smart, smart device holds onto an IPv6 address um, and then the CPE uh, gets another IPv6 address and the smart TV suddenly stops working. So that's more specifically on, on user experience or customer experience rather than us as, as network engineers. Um, so we, we also want to serve all the customers by BNGs. BNGs is quite a, a new topic for UFiber. Um, myself and the director of networks at UFiber, we've, we've not really had much experience on deploying BNGs. So uh, we, we definitely want to move towards that, um, to, towards that kind of network deployment because at the moment we're, we're only running BNGs for um, uh, customers that go over City Fiber and not uh, NetOmnia. And here, uh, uh, another obvious point again, uh, there's quite a few obvious points that I've been making in this PowerPoint presentation, but um, it's to advertise the regional blocks for IPv6 at, at specific uh, locations around England or around the UK. Obviously, we can't force IPv6 to come inbound at specific regions uh, where our data centers are. We want to mainly keep like northwest, northeast customers going out of, for example, Manchester, uh, Scotland, obviously coming out of Scotland. Um, so, so that's obviously a plan on our IPv6 deployment so to improve it is to ensure that we, we uh, advertise the IPv6 uh, pr prefixes or, or blocks at specific regions to help influence the inbound um, traffic. And uh, the last point before I can take any questions is that we, we've only recently started deploying over city fiber um, so this is quite a new concept for us as well, hence the BNGs. We've only just started introducing BNGs onto our network, so, so it would be uh, amazing if anyone's got any stories about City Fiber running on top of City Fiber. It would be brilliant to have a chat. Um, but we, at the moment, we, we, we're deploying a centralized type of BNG uh, with, with Cisco ASRs in the data centers. We are looking for a more distributed design. Uh, the, a really big buzzword, the CUPS, the controlling user plane separation. We've, we've looked at a few vendors that implement that, um, specifically like open source standards, um, or open standards, should I say, um, which is something that we, we really look forward to uh, getting our hands on with, with, with that kind of stuff. So thanks for your time, and um, I'll be willing to take any questions if anyone's got any. Good, that makes it easier for me. Good, brilliant. Cheers, thanks a lot. Thank you, Brandon. Really appreciate you. Thank you very much, Thea. Thank you. It's a good job. <laughs> okay, so now we know this is brisk 
and Chris is going to tell us about their deployment. Um, I took it as a little bit of a joke because you sent me the logo, so there is your slide. This is my slide. Yeah, a <laughs> little bit of a mix up on my part. I didn't realize I was giving an actual presentation today, so I haven't actually <laughs> prepared slides for you, but hopefully um, you won't be bored to death by what I'm about to say. Uh, my name is Chris Hills. You might also know me from Twitter or from LibreChat on or what was free known as Chaz6. I've been an IPv6 supporter for the last 20 years. I got my first 48 assignment back at Northeast Worcester College in Redditch and Bromsgrove in 2003. So hopefully one of the first. Thank you, Tim, for your work on IPv6. Um, so I'm representing BRISC today, and thank you for the award. We have been dual stacked from day one. BRISC is a fibre to the home alt net. It's coming up to two years old. We recently received the ISPA award for best in uh, fiber infrastructure, less than 100,000 customers, which we're almost about to break. And it seems that every time we order a new license for our BNG, by the time we get it, it's about time to, order, to make a new order for a new license. So we are growing pretty quickly. Uh, we, every customer gets a 48 as standard, and that is from day one. We've got over 4,000 customers now, and we see about 50% of our traffic is on IPv6. There's a couple of notable exceptions where we only see v4 traffic, disappointingly. One is BBC, and the other is Twitch. But apart from that, Facebook, I believe, thank you for hosting us, is our number one partner in terms of uh, downstream bandwidth. Brisk itself operates across the Midlands, mainly Manchester, Bradford, Burnley, and we're currently expanding into the West Midlands and south of Birmingham. Now, I'd just like to give you a bit of insight into sort of the, the problems we face in terms of an operator and deploying IPv6. So as you know, CGNAT, we have to use these days because being a new company, we, it's been difficult for us to get hold of sufficient IPv4 resources to give every customer their own address. So by default, our customers are on CGNAT, which isn't always to the delight of some people and, and understandably. So we do put people onto a static IP address if they request it. And I'll give you some of the common reasons they might request it. One is they obviously want to be able to port forward or they might say I've got a, an, a CCTV system or an alarm system, it doesn't support IPv6 and I want to be able to access it remotely. They want to host multiplayer games. Um, and one of the, another problem is they want to be able to access get access to the home network when they're travelling, or but perhaps their their phone carrier doesn't support it, or what, a lot of Wi-Fi hotspots simply don't support it. You know, you go to supermarket, you go to shops, they've got Wi-Fi hotspots, but they just don't supply IPv6. So what we do is we uh, we inform them about alternatives for start. So things like overlay networks, tail scale, Cloudflare access, these are ways that if you're behind CGNAT, you'll still be able to get a tunnel into your network, but a lot of customers aren't inclined to do that. So in which case we'll simply just put them onto an IPv4 address. Um, we, another obstacle we've had in our deployment, we've, due to the chip shortage you may have heard about. It's been quite difficult for small operators to get hold of actual CPE to install in customers. So it's been a case of we've tried to get the best we can and I think what we have is pretty good. But that we have, because it's a smaller supplier, there are p potentially more bugs than might, you might find from one of the larger, you know, Zeitzel or Technicolor, for example. So one particular issue we've had is deploying VoIP where we, we supply, we don't do TV, but we do provide voice. And we have had an issue where some customers have noticed glitches and we've narrowed, the, well, the provider of the CP have given us a workaround which is to disable IPv6, and which is very disappointing. But the good news is they have provided us with a new firmware which we've tested and we're actually literally right now in the, in the process of rolling out. So we're hoping that now every customer will have IPv6 as standard. Um, another slight niggle we've got is that with our CP, we cannot, the customers cannot specify their own DNS servers. Now, one thing ISP customers often ask you about is, oh, I, I want to make my service family friendly. And one way you can do that is by changing your DNS servers to one of the ones which will filter adult sites, gambling sites, which is all very well for IPv4. But if you can't do it for IPv6 and the devices are using, preferring the IPv6 DNS servers, then Unfortunately, the only sort of, there's, there's two options. They can either 
get them to change their DNS servers manually on those devices, which probably for a lot of people they're not going to be sure how to do. Or unfortunately, we simply disable uh, v6 for them. Uh, we are potentially looking at if we can provide a sort of tiered DNS service on a customer by customer basis, but at the moment we've not had sort of enough demand for that to make it worthwhile. Um, and that is it. So has anyone got any questions? Oh, where's the... Someone throw that man the cube. Thank you. Uh, Andre Zaltka from Ripe NCC. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. You. Uh, I wonder, you said that you somehow switched the uh, customers to V4 if they need their CCTVs or so. Do you charge them extra for that? Good question. At the moment, no. The business is currently looking to see if it's worth the expense. Obviously, these IP addresses are not free. Um, I was under the impression we were going to start charging, but so far there's no been definite, definite decision made. So at the moment, these are at no cost, and we advise them we may start charging, but for, for the foreseeable future, at the moment, there is no cost, but there may potentially be a cost. Business customers will get a V4 public as standard, but the residentials will not. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. <laughs>